Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I'm the host and the producer of the chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I'm sitting down with Carrie Poland, who's also known as Mystic Storm. Carrie is International Pony 2008 and the creator of the Pony Pride flag. Now, we have a uh, backdrop of that. I'm going to try to move a little bit so that that can be a little more easily seen. Is that pretty clear? Can people see that pretty well? I hope so. Okay, there we go. But all right, we're going to go ahead and launch right into this because we want to hear what Carrie has to tell us today. It's a beautiful day on September 4th. And Carrie, where are you today? I am actually uh, camping up in Madison, Wisconsin. Today. Camping in Madison, Wisconsin. Okay, how is it there? Oh, it's beautiful here today. Nice okay. fall, beginning of fall weather. I love it. Okay. I'm glad you've got internet connections to be able to do this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you never know when you're camping. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So how do you identify in the community? Tell us, who are you in the community? Well, um, I go by Carrie or Mystic Storm. Um, I also go by Sprite. Um, Sprite. So Sprite is my little. Uh, Mystic Storm is my pony. And then Carrie, if I'm not ponying or littling, <laughs> is typically what people might call me. Um, I identify, my, my pronouns are she, her, and pony. Okay. Um, and I identify, I guess, those are my major identifiers. Educator, um, presenter. I do wear we, a few hats. We like that. Where are you from? I'm originally from northern Indiana, from the South Bend area. Okay. Um, born and raised there. I lived there until I was in my 20s, and I had graduated college. So. Okay. Why did you leave there? Um, that's a very interesting story. So <laughs> I, I had, I was getting ready to finish my degree in graphic design. And uh, about a week before graduation, uh, a drunk person set my apartment building on fire. So I lost everything in this apartment fire. <laughs> Uh, I had an internship in Chicago lined up for the summer, so I went and did that. But I felt like, well, if I, if I ever wanted to leave the Midwest or go somewhere at, where else, now was probably the time because now everything I owned fit in my car, <laughs> which would mm -hmm. make it really easy to pick up and move anywhere I wanted. Now, when you say you lost everything, uh, elaborate a little bit on that. Um, so I lost all of my clothes, all of my fetish gear, all of my pony gear, you know, all of my furniture, like literally everything that was in my apartment was pretty much lost. There were a few items that we salvaged, um, including my pony hooves and my leather jacket. But other wow. than that, that was it. How devastating because gear like that is not only unique, it's very expensive. Yeah, most of my pony gear had been custom made for me. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't just like I could go to the Mr. S web website or whatever and order another bridle and harness that was exactly like what I had. Wow. You came out as gay relatively young with the benefit of the internet, which of course, you know, in my generation, we didn't have. So please tell us a little bit about your early exploration. And you had a really good mentor, as I recall. Yeah, so I came out as gay um, in 2001. So very early on, uh, I knew probably, I, I realized that I was gay probably in about 99. Okay. Um, and I started to use the internet to, you know, find groups and find other people like me. Um, and find support. 
And so that was helpful. Uh, and then uh, I started slowly because Indiana is fairly conservative. Um, I started slowly coming out to friends and people I, I, I felt like I knew would accept me. Finally, things came to a head. The very last people I told were my parents. Um, and we had had a huge blowout fight hmm. where my parents accused me of hiding things from them. <laughs> so I was like, yes, I have been. Here's the deal. <laughs> and so I told them that I was, you know, I was gay and everything. And, and it was a little rocky for a while, but it went, it was, they were more accepting than I originally thought would be the case. Wow. Good. Tell, tell me a little bit more about how people around you reacted in this environment. As you said, it's relatively conservative. Yeah, luckily, you know, I found the leather and kink communities when I was 18. Um, so that was 2000. Okay. And so I was active in those communities already. And so those people were open and accepting already of me. And those were the, the first places I was like, hey, you know gay I found my first mistress that kind of a thing um but it was it was more the what are my parents my my mom is you know upper middle class typical what are what's everybody else gonna think like what image do we portray to society and i was like this is not gonna go over well with her and it took her, I mean, at first she was a little, are you sure this isn't a phase? Do we, we don't need to tell other people. But then she, she definitely came around. My dad was very open and accepting from the beginning, which is kind of what I, what I expected. Um, right. It was more my mom I was worried about. Hmm. But um, she came around. She's very um, accepting now and okay with everything. So um I, I'm I'm happy for that. Like I don't feel like I I lost my family in the process of coming out, like many people do. Yeah. So I feel fortunate in that regard. But you, at 18, you discovered the the leather and fetish communities. How did you do that? Through the internet. Um. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I stumbled on fetish stuff fairly early. And I had learned that there was a local munch in South Bend. And so when I turned 18, I had a friend. Um, and I was like, hey, let's go. What do you think if we go check this out? And I, I remember clearly, you know, he was like, oh, okay, I'm up for anything. Let's try it. Huh. <laughs> and so what we were your thoughts about it? Lot of this, we, we pull into this parking lot of a restaurant. You know, it's just a regular restaurant. It's a munch. You know, but we had no idea what we were going to, you know, what we were going to encounter. And we pull in. And I was like, OK, we came. We can go home. And he's like, uh-uh, you dragged me here. We're going in. <laughs> and so what did you experience? Everybody was so friendly and welcoming. Um, you know, I made some really great friends early on. People were happy to, like, teach us things and opened my eyes to like how to be safe about meeting people and playing with people. And, you know, so it was really educational and it was yeah. a really good, I'm, I'm glad I didn't just stay on the internet and hide, you know, going out was so good for me mm -hmm. and to feel like, Oh, hey, I'm not weird. There are other people like me. <laughs> you were very young going into this. How did people react to such a young girl coming in? It didn't really phase much of anyone really oh. so it was really good in that regard everybody was much older than me um i mean there were a couple people that were grad students oh. but mm -hmm. that was about the the closest and my friend he, you know but at the time i was definitely by far and for a long time i was by far the youngest person did you go anywhere else around your area there um, so mostly in that, that group. And then, um, so I was actually a senior in high school and we started attending that munch group. And, um, I did leave Northern Indiana to go to Purdue for a short time. Um, and at the time Purdue did not have 
an active munch group. So my friend that had gone to the munch with me, he and I went to Purdue together. And so he and I started a munch in Lafayette. So you said you started a munch in Lafayette. How did you do this? Um, you know, so word of mouth. I think at one point there was a munch. There was just no one running it at the time. So he and I were like, okay, let's take it back over. Let's get it back running. Uh, at the time, everybody used Yahoo groups. Uh, so yeah, we just joined the group. We said, hey, let's start this munch again. And away we went. Um, How- we did start going to Indy and Chicago for some things also. Tell me, though, about how did people react to the Lafayette group? As far as like the restaurants or whatever that we... But just the, the the local people, how did they react to this? I don't feel like people really knew. We had, I mean, it was just a munch group. We met uh-huh. for lunch once a uh-huh. month. Um, we did have a little incident. We were meeting at one restaurant that we showed up to on the day of the munch to find a closed sign. A permanently closed sign on the door. Oh no. And we were scrambling for another location because that same month happened to be like a bunch of the people that we started going to the munch in South Bend came down to Lafayette to support us. <sighs> so there was this group coming from out of town and now we're scrambling for a munch location. And we ended up at a restaurant that actually ended up being where we stayed for years. Oh. Okay. But when we showed up, their private room already had a party going on. So they just like sat us in the middle of the restaurant. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. And there was a group of like 25 of us. That's great. <laughs> and it was no big deal. Now, yeah. you met, you mentioned you were going elsewhere. Chicago was one place you mentioned. Uh, tell us about going to Chicago at that time. Chicago at that time... Um, the club that we went to was the Leather Rose. Okay. Uh, it was the original Leather Rose run by Hans. There was like a little sex toy store in the front that you went into. Once you checked in, there was like a door and it was in like a, a row home. So it was like three stories and they had turned this house into a play space um, on the other side of the door from the store. So for the benefit of the audience, would you explain the Leather Rose? I think some people won't know it. Yeah, it's been gone for a good amount of years at this point. Um, so the Leather Rose, this was pre the Leather Rose Association, which okay. is what we have now, which was formed after Hans clo- retired and closed the Leather okay. Rose. Um, so the Leather Rose, the original Leather Rose was run solely by Hans. Um, It was a one person, you know, it was his business and his club. It was not like an organization. There was not a board. Uh, (laughs) None uh, of that at the time. uh, So, and it was like, pay your money and you can go in and play. How did you even know this existed? The South Bend group I was part of, we took a field trip, per se, um, to the Leather Rose for a play party one night when I was, I think, still in high school but 18. Wow. Um, so we carpooled up for up to Chicago from, from South Bend and we all had a great time. And so that really is the first, was my first connection to the Chicago scene and the club itself. What were your thoughts about it? Like going in, I didn't know what to expect, you know, and I had always been kind of on that. Oh, I'm weird. Like there, you know, And then to see all these other people that were just as weird as me, like, I'm like, oh, well, now I'm normal. So it felt really good and accepting to realize that there was this community and that it was, as time passed, it was growing for me. Now, you had some definitive experiences going in there. I recall when we prepared for this, you mentioned an organization called, is it MAPP, M-A-P-P? And then... Yes, the Midwest Area Pony Play Group. Okay. You just happened upon that? Um. So, yes and no. Uh, I had a, a mentor early on um, who was strictly online. I oh. 
never met him. Like I started talking to him in probably 2000 or 99 and um, didn't actually meet him until about 2008. Wow. We met in person once. Um, we happen, our past happened to be in the same kind of place. And so we met up once for coffee. But wow. other than that, it was always online. And um, he had said to me early on, he's like, I think there's this thing called pony play that you would really enjoy. And I was like, I don't know what this is, but tell me more. And I guess we'll see. And um, so then he shared online resources with me and through those resources i found the map group oh. um early on they did also hold a munch kind of regularly in chicago um so i went to that some i would drive in just for the munch and then the i went to this class that they had hosted um okay. at the leather Works. so and that was really my first foray into pony play. And that would have been 2003. How did your mentor think that this was going to be something you'd enjoy or that would be good for you? Um, so growing up, um, I loved horses. I had a horse growing up. I showed, I rode, you know, if it was up to me, I would have lived at the barn. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but one of the things, you know, through our discussions, um, before I turned 18, we talked all, all vanilla stuff, um, mm -hmm. was that <laughs> I was the oldest, I was the oldest kid at my barn by, by a lot. I think I was the only high schooler, you know, everybody was much younger and we'd yeah. all go out on Saturdays for lessons. And, um, in that we, there was always some downtime and the kids would want to play horse show. And because I was the oldest and the biggest, I always got voted to be the horse because they could get piggyback rides to play horse show. <laughs> Makes sense. So we were just kids goofing around, you know, like kids do. Yeah. And so he knew we had done that stuff. And oh. so he started questioning about, like, how did it make you feel? Do you enjoy doing it? Like that kind of stuff. And he's like, I think there's like a whole adult community that does this stuff. And I was like, really? So, and it's, and it is, it's so much like what I did playing horse show in those, in those days, except I now have money and I can buy tack and we're not just using binder twine. Like, you know, there, there's so much more you your imagination has access to as you grow older. So you apply it to those childlike principles of playing horse show and you come up with something like pony play. So what was your imagination bringing you? Um, at first it was just a lot of like what I did showing, you know, pretty prancing ponies, you know, beautiful tack you know please explain for the audience room. what tack is i again i think it's these some of these people just aren't going to know so tack is like when you when you see a, ho a, a biological horse you know bridle mm -hmm. um see. harness saddle okay that sort of a thing okay. um and you have all those very same things in pony play incredible um, incredible now and how, tell me how that evolved for you. As time went on, I realized that I, I didn't have to be just one kind of pony. So it was kind of like, wherever my imagination at the time would take me. Um, I had a My Little Pony persona that I did for the contest, where I wear a tutu and a purple corset and as far as, you know, My Little Ponies have that little heart on their hoof. I went as far as making a heart, a purple heart, out of electrical tape for my hand hoof, you know. So it was about taking pieces of other things and applying it to pony play. 
Uh, at one point I was like, I want to be a war horse. You know, I, I got after the fire, before I got my tech replaced, we had been at IML and one of the vendors had heard my story and they were a chain mail or a chain harness vendor. And they gifted me two chain harnesses. Hmm. And so that inspired me to go, well, I could, I could wear this chain harness and I'm going to make a tail out of chain and I'm going to be a war horse, you know? (laughs) Now, how many people were surrounding you in this? Was it a larger community? So there were, there, I had a great amount of friends from the math group. Uh, I had started connecting from going once i turned 21 i could attend events and i met more individuals than at events that also were into pony play um some of those people i still talk to to this day so um and and the map group would have their own events occasionally mast and i would go yeah yeah no map the the midwest area pony oh i'm wrong sorry about that yes yeah that they would have their own pony events. So I would go to those and I would meet people there. What so events do they do? I mean, kept growing. I, I have to admit, I, I've never really heard about it. Um, so there were a few events. Um, the first one I had ever gone to uh, was in Niles, Michigan. Uh, somebody knew somebody with some property and they let us come out and do pony play out on this property. Wow. And it was great. There were probably one to two dozen people total. Okay. Uh, some people had brought carts. Some people had brought, um, you know, you know, lots of tech. At that time, I was still very new. I had a bridle. And that was it. Um. Because I was still learning who I was as a pony at that point. And so I was just trying different things. Somebody in the group actually brought a four-wheel, six six pony, pony girl, boy, hitch, cart, big four-wheeler, hold, held four to six people, two rows of seats. It was amazing. Wow. And they got us all hitched up and we pulled it through this property. Wow. No. Um, and that was also... The- First time I met Paul Reed, and he was the one that um, published Equus Eroticus. Okay, Equus Eroticus, okay. Now, for the benefit of the audience, please tell us what that was or is. Equus Eroticus was a print magazine uh, that was all about pony play. Uh, Pictures... Uh, articles about events that would happen, articles about people and places. Um, So it wasn't just pictures. It was also articles and information and that sort of thing. You know, it was the early, what there was, you know, Mm pre-internet. This Equus Erotica started pre-internet. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that would have been how you got your information. Wow. Now, um, is it still in publication or how is it even? It is no longer in, it's no longer in publication. And recently um, I did see Paul Reed had posted that he was clearing out all the back stock stock he had at his home. Um, It's, I think, 20 printed, uh, 20 printed magazines for the whole collection. Okay. And he was selling them as sets of twenty. You can get, you could get them. I don't know if he has any left. Um, I had, it was posted in the Pony Play groups on Fat Life, um, but yeah, I know he was trying to get rid of what was left that he you had. Didn't, you didn't buy any. Uh, I did not. Um, I have access. To, well, I had a collection that I lost in the buy. Uh, so. Yeah. But I have I have a friends and you know the Crucible has their own pony group and they have their own like the Crucible pony group has a collection in their library so I have plenty of places I can go and see and peruse them at this point. Okay, now 
You mentioned a moment ago, finding yourself as a pony. Tell us how you did that. It was just a lot of exploration. I like you, you really like try it. And like at the more I did it, the more I kind of figured out what my personality was and how I would get into headspace and And that's different for every pony. So like they can't tell you, oh, this is the way to do it. You kind of have to like explore and figure it out as you go. So So, that's what what I would discover in all this exploration. Who are these ponies? My it's, it's interesting. So people that knew, excuse me, my biological horse. And then knew me as a pony player, as the pony. Could see very similar personalities between oh, the two. Which okay. at the time, I never like realized that she had such influence hmm. on who I was becoming as a pony. Because by that time, she was not part of my life. You know, my parents sold her when I went to college. Okay. Um, so she hadn't been part of my life but here she was influencing how i felt as a pony player she's very headstrong and she's not you know mystic storm is not like the beginner pony you know she's not the one you would want to go take a a nice leisurely trail ride she needs a firm hand and somebody that really kind of knows what they're doing (laughs) Or she will take advantage of you. <laughs> How so? She's done some naughty business in her days. Uh, Mystic Storm has taken off with people's hats. She's run off with the whole box of sugar cubes. Um, she has gotten, you know, when other people have showed interest in trying to handle her, she's gotten loose and like run amok in a play space that was fully in swing <laughs> how, how was she brought back then how how was she managed if she's doing this well typically if i'm being handled by somebody that knows what they're doing um you don't let it get to that point oh. it, those types of things typically happened when somebody else was at the reins or mystic storm was free on her own just kind of doing her own thing okay <laughs> but you can do pony play without a partner so sometimes i was places and i didn't have a partner so i just kind of did my own thing the contest tell me how you went to the contest and what what did you do so i had been in the leather community for quite a few years at the time and um had been going to iml and gla so i had been to quite a few leather contests um at that point and i i don't know I can't remember if somebody told me about it or I I saw it online, but I saw an advertisement about the first international pony trainer contest. Wow. And it was a leather contest. It was being held similar to the puppy trainer contest, which is a couple's contest. Um, so you, you know, so I saw this, I read through the materials. I was like, well, my trainer and I qualify. So I come home from work one day and I'm like, Hey, Luna, what do you think? Do you want to do this? And she's like, Oh, I think we could. When is it? Two months from now. (laughs) And she was like, are you kidding me? And we had two months to prepare for competing and running for a leather title. What did that entail? Um, it entailed reaching out to people that we knew to get sponsorship stuff, to get donations for our auction basket. Uh, it meant preparing outfits. Um, one thing you'll kind of, one of the things that we, was a challenge for us when we competed was, is that typically in pony play, I have like a set of tags. I don't have like changes of outfits necessarily. Uh, like you, uh, in uh, most leather contests, each section you wear a different outfit. Uh, you know. Okay. So okay. we were racking our brains to figure out: okay, what different ways can we style 
the pony tack or Luna's clothes to make it seem like we, you know, have made those transitions for the different parts. Okay. Uh, so that was challenging. For what us. different parts are there? Um, well, there was uh, interviews, fundraising, uh, on stage pop question. Uh, we had to give a speech, which was very interesting. I had to hold the microphone with my hooves. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I love it. <laughs> because there, there was, you know, like in, a, in most leather contests, there's a fantasies. But instead of a fantasy for pony players, you do a, a routine. A routine. So we okay. had just finished our routine. We had just finished our pony routine that we had planned. Uh, when we had to move into the speech section of the of the night, so wild. wild. The uh, the other thing we did leading up is that is when I designed the pony pride flag. Let's take let's take one step uh, to the side before we go into that because you you brought up Luna and we hadn't brought her up prior to that. Please explain uh, the relationship there and how did you two even come together. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. So Luna, uh, Luna Bear and I have been in some varying form of a relationship um, pretty much since we met. Um, so we met at one of these Midwest area pony play uh, pony events. Mm -hmm. It was held in Ann Arbor, Michigan. She came with a group of people that I only knew a few people of from Chicago and met up with me in Indiana, and we all went up to, it was outside of Detroit, so we all go, go up there together. And so that was the, we spent the weekend together, um, and she was very new to the lifestyle at that point. Oh, okay. So she had never experienced any of this. She had, you know, and her mistress at the time was there, and her mistress was like, can we keep the pony talking about me? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was like, well, you kind of have to ask the pony. But <laughs> So I had started on a journey with Luna's mistress being my pony handler and, okay. and trainer at the time. So Luna and I were like sister submissives in a sense at that point. But then Luna and I started dating. So then we were dating for a while. Um, and then that kind of just fizzled out. But we've always stayed really close friends. Um, she was actually there the night my apartment burned down. And I think oh. if it wasn't for her, I might not have gotten out of the building. Oh, God. Um, so we have been through so much together. She moved out to the East Coast with me after I had moved out there. And even though we were just friends, we were always close. And so she started as my pony like groom early on and then as things progressed and as my relationships changed she moved more into the trainer role okay for me and handler and whatnot and that's where we still are you know today even though i you know we live in very different parts of the country and so we don't see each other very often but she's always there if i need somebody to talk to or bounce ideas off of or tell my crazy what I want to do now with pony play things to that's who I call. <laughs> that's beautiful. How, how wonderful to have. Yeah. Yeah. So now you brought it up. We've got to talk about it. And that is the pony pride flag. Tell us what this means. It, it's fascinating. So part of running for a title is having a platform you're going to run on. And for a few years, I had been considering, you know, pony play doesn't really have representation as far as a pride flag, you know, yeah. but it wasn't until I decided we decided to run for the title that I went, let's do this. Let's make this our our platform. We want to show the world that pony play is part of leather and that we are here and we are proud of it. And so... Being the graphic designer I am, I just started putting together ideas. And one of the things 
working on it early on, I was like, everything has to have meaning. It can't just be random yeah. things thrown yeah. together. <laughs> so what are some of the meanings of this? So the black parts of the flag, um, those pay homage to the leather pride flag. They are, you know, to show we are part of leather. There is leather in pony flag. So that's what the black stands for. Um, the white stripe that you see in the background uh, is consistent with the innocent inner free spirit of every pony. Okay. Doesn't matter what kind of pony you are, every pony is a free spirit to be whatever they want to be. Love it. Um, the blue, the blue has a dual meaning. The blue is for those ponies that love to compete, try to achieve that blue ribbon and the competitions, that sort of thing. And then it also me, it's also there to represent the denim and the cowboys oh. and the cowgirls. Okay that also want to participate, you know, that are part of the pony community. Um, then we move to the green. The green circle signifies, you know, outside and the pastures, places that you see and want to think about where you would see ponies. Uh, and then the horseshoes are kind of self-explanatory. <laughs> they tie everything together and yeah. we're here to do pony play. And a horseshoe is a universal symbol of of horses and ponies. Yeah. So I love it. It's so unique. Absolutely <laughs> unique. But before we move on to the second part here, I think it's time we met Mystic Storm. You want to meet Mystic Storm? I would like to meet Mystic Storm. I think the pet the audience would do. Okay. Please. Well, please. Mystic Storm has has transformed over the years. And the current in the, you know, incarnation of Mystic Storm is a rainbow zebra. A rainbow diva. I love it. Z zebra. Zebra. Oh, I'm sorry. Rainbow zebra. Zebra. And she's got rainbow mane and tail. I love it. Now. So this is my current persona with Mystic Storm. You still and have the others, don't you, the originals? I do. I still have my tech and whatnot, but because of my limitations due to my health, um, I do pony play from a wheelchair now. And so I felt like that called to me to have a new kind of pony persona. It's still okay. Mystic Storm, and she's still feisty, and she still gets into trouble. And it's still a handful, but she does it all from her wheelchair. Okay. So that that makes it significantly different than what you typically see in the pony community. Tell us about so, that. About which? My wheelchair pony? The transition over into that, because it's very, very, very unique. Back in 2017, and I started having to use the wheelchair because I couldn't be on my feet and I couldn't be active. I thought Mystic Storm, as I knew her, was dead, essentially. Uh, I thought uh, she was retired. I thought she was not coming. She was not going to be able to, to pony anymore, essentially. Uh, I see. Uh, and like most people that start having to, you know, that have injuries or whatever that have to transition into a wheelchair, there is a mourning period essentially. And I sure. think I went through that with mystic storm and it wasn't until I could kind of be out of the mourning period and accepting of this was okay. That I realized that, well, maybe I could do pony play in my wheelchair. Like maybe I just didn't, I hadn't thought outside the box enough. Yeah. You know, maybe this isn't the end. Uh, so I just was like, all of a sudden there was this like light bulb moment. And, be and, and because I'm in the wheelchair, the tack I had didn't really work. So I had to kind of figure out what was going to work with my wheelchair. Um, and kind of start from scratch and build that from scratch. 
And so that's kind of what we did. And as I went and did pony play for the first time with somebody that you've actually already interviewed, um, sub Miss Anne. Oh, yes. I did pony play in my wheelchair with her for the very first time. Wow. Now. And I didn't really at that at that point, I wasn't I didn't have any. I didn't have my lovely zebra head. You didn't have none what, of that had come. My my lovely zebra head here. Uh, uh. I just had some, you know, I was wearing my old bridle. I had some basic reins. I had an idea. But I didn't know if it was going to work. So until we actually did it and the euphoria I felt. Well, tell us what happened. Tell us what you did. So I'm out. At, we're out in L.A. We're at a L.A. Pony and Critter pony gathering with Anne, and i said hey do you want to try taking the reins because the partner at this point had never he didn't know anything about pony play huh. so she was like sure i'll give it a try and so she has like a dressage ring that's artificial turf and so my wheelchair is pedal powered she she was able to follow me and give me cues with the reins Wow. Um, and wow. we just kind of worked through how it was all going to kind of work and try some things. And we just kind of got in the swing and I slipped right into headspace and it was amazing. And I felt so good afterwards. Wow. What an accomplishment. I can't even imagine it. Now, what do you think uh, made that so successful? What made it work so well? I think me being open-minded that it was okay that I didn't look like every other pony out there. Wow. You know, I had never seen another pony wheelchair. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people don't realize necessarily that you can do something unless you see others that look like you. Fair. And there weren't, uh, there aren't other, there, at the time, there weren't any others that looked like me. Wow. So I just thought I just couldn't. Why, why can't I? Why can't I be different? There's no reason I can't be different. Yeah. That's simply amazing to me, truly, uh, to take something that's really redefined you and grab that and make it your own. I find it incredible. Yeah. And it was, you know, Mystic Storm was such a part of me for all these years. And then to not be able to tap into that I think mm -hmm. I was struggling a lot with and I couldn't get past that and so I think finding that I can you know I could still let her out to play and now it may it looks different there are you know it's definitely I can't do as much I can't go like trail riding or like uh, off I, I'm more limited because I'm limited to where I can easily go with my wheelchair safely um but i can do it and i can have fun and that's what matters now you're, you're in a very unique situation here in which you're enjoying your uh, activities and you're managing limitations of a wheelchair somewhere out there are going to be other people who are physically challenged what advice can you give them? Don't be limited by what you think you can't do. Open your mind and think about what might be possible. Mm -hmm. um, I actually taught for the first time back in May an adaptive pony play class. Wow. Wow. So, because there is, you know, a need, not just for mo people in mobility devices, but people that may have limited mobility or hearing issues, or there's so many things. Yes. And that shouldn't stop you from doing the thing you love or that you want to do. Yeah. How did people react to that class? We had like a dozen people. I was shocked. Uh, everybody was really into it, helping, giving out feedback and ideas when we talked about different areas mm. um talking from personal experience tapping in like and people realized uh there was 
someone else that attended my class in a wheelchair and she was brand new to pony play and thought she couldn't do pony play, but then saw I was offering this class and came to the class and she's like, wow, I could do pony play. Like, it doesn't matter that I'm in this wheelchair. Wow. That's beautiful. And so I taught my class and I invited anyone that wanted to. We did a demo for the Camp Crucible Pony Show. I didn't actually compete in the show because I was one of the judges. Hmm. Um, but I, we did a demo with me in my chair. Um, and we, at one point in the routine, invited anyone doing any kind of adaptive pony play to come out on the, on the stage, essentially, and join us and show off your adaptive pony play. Show everybody there that it doesn't matter. You can do it no matter what you look like. We had someone in a wheelchair, a pony in a wheelchair. We had a handler with a cane. We had a pony on like a tricycle bike thing that, you know, because she had a leg injury. Wow. You know, sky's the limit. Yeah. Let this be a um, an educational moment for anybody out there who thinks you can't do it. Not true. No, uh, use your imagination. Figure yeah. out how it works for you. It doesn't matter if it looks like anyone else. What matters yeah. is, are you having fun? Are you enjoying yourself? That's all that matters. Nothing truer. Absolutely beautiful. I love it. But you mentioned earlier, we're going to shift gears a little bit here. Uh, mm -hmm. You're part of the Littles community. Would you tell us about that, please? And I think some of the audience may need you to explain it. <laughs> So the Littles community or the age play community um, is a community of people who enjoy role playing at younger ages, everywhere from infancy through like teen years, typically. Uh, it's not about having any kind of interaction with actual minors. That's one of the biggest misconceptions of yeah. age play yeah. and Littles. There are no minors involved. We're all consenting adults. Um, it's just... You got to, you know, you have a childlike personality and you want that to come out. And this is the way to do it. What drew you to this? This is fascinating. Uh, actually, somebody early on in my. That munch group in South Bend was an age player. And so they introduced it to me really early on. So that's been a part of my identity, really, from the beginning. Oh, OK. OK. There are going to be people out there again, who are going to be new to pony play, have never, maybe never heard of it, whatever. Someone going into this, what are some of the best practices you can advise for them? For pony play, best yes. practices is that you can, you can do your initial research online, but you can only do so much on the internet. And I really encourage anyone to, if you can find a local community, a local play space that may have an animal play or po like or pony specific, but if they don't have a pony specific, any animal themed night, you'll probably find other pony players there. Okay. Um, the puppy community I have found to be very accepting of the pony community as well. I've done many a leather pup event as a pony and been very well accepted. So. Beautiful. You're just going to look for communities that are either specific for ponies or pony adjacent, I would say, and go out and meet people and see it and experience it and try it. How does someone go about finding this? Fat Life is a great resource. There are tons of pony play groups on Fat Life, most mm -hmm. events, post there as well um if you live near a larger city you're more likely to have access to a pony community uh oh. such as uh, washington dc the crucible down has their own pony group that meets almost every month um the crucible also hosts uh camp crucible which is a nine day camping experience where they have a whole pony play track the entire time like you could just go to pony classes every day and then participate in the pony show that they have um during that that period uh 
but there's so much more to do there as well. Same, yeah. they just, they have an event called Crucible Con. Crucible Con does have uh, a pony aspect. There will be pony players and some pony meetups and stuff. So you just kind of want to look. Events that are happening will have pony classes or okay. animal play classes. Um, I've taught at events all over the country, pony play classes. So they weren't necessarily pony play events. Um, but there were ponies there and I was there teaching classes. So you just, you look for those things. If you're going to be going to a weekend conference or events or whatever, look at the schedule, look at the classes. Yeah. Are there animal play specific ones? Even if it's not pony specific, if it's animal play, go find out who else there is into pony play. Do your and then do it. Yeah. Like find a, find a, I've done plenty of pony play in hotel hallways then you know, play spaces and you know right. you just kind of have to there's been there was a historic pony stampede that i might have been part of wrangling up one year through the formal dinner at the vr event um so think five you know you got 200 people having a formal dinner served in this ballroom and all of a sudden you've got a stampede of ponies my gosh. Oh, I can't even imagine. So, <laughs> huh. so you just you just gotta you gotta have your eyes open and you'll find us. What sorts of things should people avoid? I recommend not like jumping in and buying all sorts of tack mm. and leather and yeah. boots and I kind of feel like it's best to kind of feel your way in and see what kind of pony you feel like before you start doing that stuff. Yeah. Because it does, it is expensive. It's an expensive hobby. Yes. Um, or it can be. So if you just like jump in and buy a bunch of stuff and then decide, oh, well, I bought this pony cart, but I don't like to pull carts. Well, now you've got this cart. That you've got to either sell or find somebody, you know, yeah. store. So it's best to kind of figure out what parts of pony play you enjoy before you start investing in all of the stuff. And yeah. it can get overwhelming because there is a lot of stuff. Yeah, I believe that. And a lot of options. So what's the biggest misconception you've heard? about pony play the biggest misconception is that we are actually doing things with biological horses and that is not the case there are no biological horses at all <laughs> just people consenting adults role playing as horses and ponies or unicorns and zebras yeah. or pegasus like like i said like your imagination is the only thing limiting you on what you want to do What's the funniest thing you've ever heard somebody say about it? Like, I've seen some ponies do some pretty crazy things over the years. Like a stampede in the middle but of I've the dinner. Never... <laughs> yeah, like stampede in the middle of the dinner. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's priceless. My gosh. What's the biggest misconception about you personally? Biggest misconception about me. There's probably two big misconceptions about me. Hmm. One, one is that I'm extroverted. Um, you know, being that I'm a title holder and the creator of the Pony Pride flag, you kind of have to put yourself out there and yes. interact and talk to people and go to things. And that is hard for me. And that's one of the reasons I did it because it was pushing me outside of my comfort zone. I am definitely an introvert. And if I'm at an event, I'm going to need some downtime in between stuff to recharge because doing all the socializing and educating and is a stretch for me. Okay. Um, because that's not naturally my personality. Wild. Uh, the other biggest that people don't believe that I'm leather. Uh. Because I don't fit your stereotypical. This is what a leather dyke or whatever should look like yeah yeah um and i've like as you've heard me talk i'm all about pushing the bounds of 
I can be a pony in a wheelchair. <laughs> so I can, leather isn't to me about what you wear. Leather right. to me is about who you are and your values. Correct. And I think that's where a lot of misconception comes from is that because I'm not wearing five tons of leather, yeah. um, therefore I am not leather, which is not true. Yeah. Um, my current vest, as you see here, is mm. denim primarily because in my wheelchair, my leather vest is really uncomfortable. You can't see my back patch because my back is against the chair. So I, oh. I thought outside the box about how do I make this comfortable? How do I make it so I can put stuff, more stuff on the front and visible to people? You know, this is who I am. And, and denim is such a part of horses and a part of the original leather culture leather levi culture yes so but to, to some people they see this and they say well you're not leather you're not wearing leather pants and a and a leather vest and a master's cap and a but yeah. to me i don't i don't need to wear it to be it Agreed. So i think that's a big misconception about how people see it. let's be able to say goodbye now to mystic storm we do have to say we said hello we have to say goodbye would you like to see her on? Yes. Yes. Let's do it. Not going to turn down a good opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> One second here. Man, could be wild. Wow. That looks amazing. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> well, I have to say, Carrie and Mystic Storm, thank you for this amazing interview for Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out the Fireside Chat channel for more chapters in the history of leather. And don't forget to hit like and subscribe.